Greetings and salutations, everyone. It's time for another episode of Viewport Relay, a bi-weekly podcast where the Viewport team looks at the latest news in the gaming industry. As always, I'm your host, Albert Corson, joined by Tristan Jung. Hello. And Alex Nestor. Hey. Guys, it's episode 24. You know what that means? There, There is a distinct oversaturation of Final Fantasy... Final Fantasy. There, yeah, there's too much Final Fantasy 14, so we're not going to talk about what games we played, because I know exactly what games you guys played. <laughs> and uh-huh. by games, I mean game. Well, I played you know Apex what? Legends. Just played Apex Legends. I was mm-hmm. going to say that. And I played Devil um, May Cry 5, so okay. can't get on well, me for that. Yeah. Get on. Not maybe this week. This, that maybe this is the sense. week I should have asked that. But you know, we're not doing that. We're changing the name of that segment that I can never remember the name of. And now it's called Fast Favorites because things and guys, let me know. Fast Favorites. What is your favorite video game boss or bosses? You can choose multiple. I won't be picky. Yeah, I'll give one everyone's thinking about. The Great Mighty Pooh from Conker's Bad Fur Day. A classic boss. Can you can you go into depth about this? <laughs> what? That, that's it. That's it. That, Every, is that it? Everybody knows the great mighty Pooh. He sings the song. I actually don't. I played All like right. an hour of Conker's Bad Fur Day, and then my parents said I couldn't play that game. Yeah, it's a pretty filthy game. And the, the song is also filthy. But you should listen to it now. You're old enough. Oh, I'm an adult. I can mm-hmm. do what I want. I gave you permission. Thank you. Thank you, Dad. You're um, welcome. I had a boss, and I chose it for its uniqueness um, and using your noggin. And that boss is GLaDOS, and mm. I'm not mm. exclusively choosing either Portal 1 or Portal 2. I think they're both great. I think Portal 2 was better. It was cooler, at least. But um, a boss where there's no HP bars... There's no, there, well, you have a gun, but it doesn't, like, shoot bullets. You gotta use your brain and the environment to defeat your foes. Um, I guess technically you didn't fight GLaDOS in Portal 2, but I guess I was, I was in the, in the mindset of Portal Final Bosses. Uh, mm-hmm. but, you know. Just, I think you have one now? Oh, I, I if if he doesn't, I have another one. I, so. No, I got one. I, I'm I'm on the the rare train like Alex. I was thinking Gruntilda from Banjo Kazooie, mm. the whole trivia game sequence. Can you not? Oh my god! Oh, oh no! I think Gross. I think that really tests. You know, have you really been been paying attention? Mm-hmm. How many pillars are in this scene? Mm-hmm. That was that was it. That was it. I mean, also there's like the final final battle on the top of the tower that that's also oh speaking of top of towers i think super mario world bowser copter top three at least of favorite boss fights all right i, I Epic. respect that it mm-hmm. uses a little bit different mechanics than you're used to when you're killing all the other uh koopalings and it actually feels a little bit epic with all the fire uh balls coming down and peach is yelling in the bowser copter koopa copter that's definitely a good one you know, now that you bring that up, all right, one of my favorite bosses, oldie but a goodie, Yoshi's Island, final boss, Baby Bowser, the music, so good, so good, mm. and the fight, so good. He just looms in the distance, and you got to shoot him with eggs as he menacingly approaches. Yeah, that's pretty cool. Alex, you got a last one for us? You want to yeah. multiple? I think my second mention would be uh, The End from Metal Gear Solid 3, Snake Mm. Eater. Mm -hmm. There's just so many ways you can approach the encounter. You can either do a sniper battle or you can try to sneak up on him and do all kinds of things. Smoke cigarettes in his face to make him cough. Uh, Or you can just, you know, save the game, advance your clock like two weeks and uh, just kill him from old age. Whatever works to win. Truly the end for that man. (laughs) <laughs> oh, I, I get they, it. They, they make that joke in the game. Got him. Mm-hmm. Kojima had you covered. All right, you got one more? I don't have any more. Nah. I like nah. those two. Okay, that's fine. We're rolling on. Um, 
Mr. Twitter correspondent Tristan Jung here. He's Hello. been he's been rocking it with some oh no GDCers. What, uh, what? No, no. Okay. no. I don't want to rock it with just random okay, people. He's been associating with some GDCers. He got a chance to play some indie games. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Tell us about that. Tell us. Of course. Um, so I was invited by the Media Indie Exchange or the Mix to come out and attend their showcase develop. Uh, their uh, wh- what was it called? Actually, they they just called the Mix. Um, they had a bunch of different indie games show up across a couple of de- uh, different indie developers, and I got to talk to a lot of different devs, try out their games. Obviously, I'm not going to go over all the games because I think they had like 20 to 30 of them. Mm -hmm. Give us some standouts. What were uh, appealing to you? What were some surprises? Yeah, so I think one of the really good ones I got to play was called Young Souls. Mm. It is a beat-em-up with a little bit of kind of looting. Um, So there's, you know, you can level up your equipment. There's co-op built in. There's kind of a uh, roguelike element of randomly generated levels. And the art style is very, very unique. There's a little bit of 2D, a little bit of 3D. I think you guys should all look it up uh, once you're done listening to this or while you're listening to this. And I found the gameplay to be a lot of fun. So that was one. I got to play with the CEO of Limited Run Games. We played together and he died. What? Literally died? He literally yeah, died. He literally like, died on the spot. I got to spot. play a game with Tristan Jung, and he just yeah. died on the spot. The second one that I really liked that I got to play was, of course, Untitled Goose Game. We yeah. saw it at Popular PAX. one from PAX, yep. Yeah. We couldn't get in line. Fortunately, at this event, there weren't... It wasn't, like, a public event, so I... Like, no one was playing this game, so I just kind of walked up. All four of the devs were there. We talked a lot about kind of what were some of the inspirations, what they're adding, what is the end game content for this game, because that's very important. Wait, wait, mm-hmm. wait. What were the inspirations behind this game? <laughs> I will go into that in our article when I okay. publish it later this week or next Ooh, week. The tease. The tease. Always a tease, Tristan John. Mm-hmm. So that was a lot of fun. And I think the last game that I really, really liked was called Blazing Beaks. Unfortunately, the dev was super jet-lagged, and Mm. I don't know if he just didn't want to talk to me, or probably that, but he was a little low energy. But this game was similar to Binding of Isaac or uh, Gungeon, Enter the Gungeon. So it's it's a a roguelike... Yep, yeah. with guns, except that you can only... It's closer to Isaac because you can only have one gun. So you have to make these decisions on, do I want gun A, gun B? And there's also another feature of you can pick up these cursed objects that give you... Uh, basically give you downgrades in certain features, like you can't pick up hearts or your abilities uh, hurt you, etc. But then later at the shop, you can trade them in for, like, superpowers. Yeah. So, okay. Ooh. It was a lot of fun. Um, he was asking me some very fundamental questions. He's like, do you feel like you should hold multiple guns? Like, how do you feel about this and that? So I, I had some good conversations. But yeah, like I said, I'll be kind of putting up uh, an article with all the different games I got to check out there. It was a lot of fun. There's another event happening tomorrow. So we'll see what happens. Um, that one's featuring Asian developers, because I guess there were no Asian developers at this one I went to yesterday. Asian as in, like, from Asia, or, like, they're actually just of Asian descent? Uh, both? <laughs> I don't know. They called it, like, the Asian showcase, and I thought it was kind of weir- a weird way to name something. Okay, something tells me it's just devs from Asia, I, w- I would assume. It's interesting to think about that you don't think of, like, an indie game scene... In Japan, let's say, right? All right. Sounds like you had a good time. Let's, yep. uh, we got more news from GDC today, hot off the presses, as of six hours ago, seven hours ago. Google, you know, rumored making a console, um, and then rumored that it's not gonna be a console, maybe, um, we got to learn about it, and it's called Google Stadia. 
and it's not a console, but it is a means of playing games. That's how I'll put it. Mm, Essentially, a controller. Yeah. It ha- okay. Let's 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 give the quick rundown. It's essentially a streaming platform where in any Chrome browser, so whether it's on your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your TV, even you can stream games online, 1080p, 60fps to that device, um, and then they will be releasing a controller along with it, um, and it'll have some cool. They talked a lot. This obviously it was a GDC conference. It wasn't some sort of marketing. It wasn't like a like a press conference at like Google I/O or something. So they obviously didn't talk about some of the things that a consumer would want to know, like price, how the games, how you're going to buy the games, a subscription, or do you buy what games? games are coming out? Yeah, I mean they announced one, right? So they said Doom Eternal was coming to the platform. Um, they're working with it on that. Uh they also brought up a lot of things related to, oh, I forget the term for it, but it was like that persistent environment. So they're, they're essentially, they say there's a lot of cool things about this in terms of the fact that the hardware is run on Google servers and not your own. That allows for things that haven't been done before in video games, like potentially hundreds of players all in, like in one like FPS server or something like that. Um, which uh, that was a little, maybe, I think they said thousands maybe. Um, cause oh, I was like hundreds. My 1000 player battle royale dream is coming true. They, you know, it could happen. Tetris 1000. All right. Oh, oh the Tetris next 10, evolution. Um, but yeah, essentially they're, they're also sort of framing this a lot in terms of the developer. Like obviously this is GDC. So they were talking a lot about how they can help developers and how that it would support unreal and unity and how they use their platform, their platforms easier to develop games on. A lot of, I don't want to get too much into the weeds in terms of the minute details, but initial reactions. So, and I just want to frame this as we already have some things like Sony has PlayStation now, right? And then we know that Microsoft is developing their own sort of streaming. That one might be a console, but streaming something. Um, how do you think Google, what do you, this is Google's foray into mediums that play video games. What, what do you what do you think about them? First thing is Phil Harrison probably worked on this, and he worked at Sony and Microsoft, so he probably took whatever issues and challenges that that they face over there. And honestly, honestly, I think this is a very unique take on the streaming service, right? It's, it's very similar to Netflix almost, right? You don't have to buy anything. It mm-hmm. just kind of sits Just go there through the, the browser. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's very unique. The first two things that came up to my mind was what happens on bad internet, like I have, right? Is this even mm-hmm. going to work? Second thing is how does the controller feel? Because they said you can use your own controller if you want. Does that mean they didn't really think about the controller design? Um, so I recall them saying in the press conference that you can use your own controller, mm-hmm. which is fine. Mm-hmm. But if you use the Google controller, the Google controller actually doesn't use Bluetooth. It uses Wi-Fi, mm-hmm. and that internet connection connects directly to the server. Mm-hmm. So apparently there's something about less latency or something, like a smoother gameplay with that. That doesn't... Mm, yeah makes sense yeah i don't know about that one the thing i saw was uh they're saying you can do basically everything with a normal controller but i guess if you have this google controller you can capture gameplay and live stream it directly to youtube with like one button press and then something else that was kind of equally you, useless you can do the voice thing right you can right the built-in microphone yeah the google yeah. assistant so you can uh yeah. put on journalist difficulty <laughs> How do I make this jump in Cuphead? <laughs> I made that joke last night, actually. Oh, man. Uh, I, I was like, hey, is this game on journalist mode? And the dev was just kind of like, uh. Oh. <laughs> Anyways, um, I think on paper, this is like the perfect 
gaming experience if you don't care about having physical copies of everything, right? You take this controller everywhere, you can play it anywhere you want, assuming mm-hmm. they have really good internet. You, you can access all the games you want, you don't have to worry about what screen you're playing on, it runs on your phone, your browser, your TV. I think it, it, it's basically trying to take everything to the next level, but in practice, I don't know if it's gonna work, mostly due to the inter- internet issue. So, hmm. I didn't see I'll, or hear. Did they kind of say what kind of data rate you'll need to be able to stream these smoothly? I saw um, Google's recommended thing for their beta, Google Stream. Mm-hmm. Um, it said for the best, for the most consistent, at least have a connection of 35 megabits. Okay. Hmm. Um, yeah. But obviously, that would be for 1080p 60 FPS, which most people are probably fine with. But once they get into 4K or... Um, they said they're also working on 8K as well as um, oh God. 100, 120 FPS and above streaming. Obviously, you'd need much better internet for that. The 8K was more of like a way in the future. They're like, not in, right. people don't even really have 8K displays right now, but you know. I think the coolest thing that I didn't think about is what you brought up with kind of latency and servers, right? If everyone's kind of playing on the same server, because Google's hosting the hardware, which means they can run their own dedicated servers if they really, really wanted to for uh, certain multiplayer games. I think that'd be a really cool experience. Although, you know, now there's the latency from the server to your TV, so I don't know how that would work out. Mm-hmm. They talked about one cool feature in that um, since it's running on Google's hardware, they could make persistent worlds that are forever persistent because it's not like running. <laughs> Okay. And that's what they said. I don't know. They're like, hey, you could do this thing in this world where you do something and then three months later it's still there because it's running on our hardware. Mm-hmm. So I don't know what they mean. Do they say if you spin up a Minecraft server and put a block down three months later it'll still be there? I don't know. Science is still out on that one. The 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 real one that I didn't that I thought of before they said it was since it's running on Google's hardware, there's no cheaters on their platform. Because you can't alter, like the the the, the game files at all. Uh, so I mean, hackers find a way. Life uh finds a way. Life uh finds a way. That is true. That is true. Um, Alex, you got anything? No, but that got... that doesn't stop cheaters from joining the same game as you. Because like we're assuming that all cheaters are gonna play on Stadia or Stadia now. I mean, mm-hmm. they could they could do it where they, for some games, it limits to Stadia or something like that. Mm. And I guess there are, like, Stadia also has their own studio, which will make exclusive games from what it sounds like. Yeah. This, this one is interesting for me in that I feel that with, just from how I've played with, like, on TVs, and sometimes there's, like, input lag on console games, if your TV doesn't have, like, a game mode or something. Mm-hmm. That you kind of move the joysticks and it sort of, it lags a little, but it, it's not that bad. I feel if I were, I haven't tested, I didn't test out Google Stream, but if I moved my mouse to the right in an FPS and it took a delay to move the mouse right, it would be really jarring for me. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I'm curious to see if their uh, Wi-Fi theory actually works to remove that delay or if it just delays both your input and your... <laughs> What you're seeing on screen. I don't know. It'll be weird. But yeah, we'll see more once it actually gets more out of the development phase. The one thing I'm concerned about is... I have a feeling Google's smart. They can get maybe the latency down, right? They can figure... I mean, obviously, there'll always have to be some latency. But they can. They have smart people. They can do something. And they have data centers everywhere. So they can probably find a place close to you. And they're able to... Uh, like compress that data that they need to stream in and out somewhat enough. <laughs> it's like um, one bit, but it just expands into it. Okay. Yeah. It's mm-hmm. that, it's that zip file that expands into like petabytes or something. Right. Um, but I read that according the same thing with the Google speed, like 35 megabits, they, they posted about data usage mm-hmm. and it's estimated with the, they could obviously the the stream was an older platform, and they're obviously going to change how Stadia works. But it was estimated to use ten gigabytes of data per hour. Oh God! So if you're on the go, um, <laughs> that's With not your cell work. phone plan. First of all, you're probably not going to be able to find internet fast enough on the go to support this. But still, like, 
I have Comcast. I have a terabyte of data every month. And so that would be a hundred hours of just video games, but obviously video games aren't the only thing I do in my life. Um, but yeah, that's a lot of data usage. So that one, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to get around, right? You, you, as I talked about compression, right? Obviously you want to try to compress things as much as possible. Um, but at the same time, games are a little different than movies and videos. If you compress a video, you get a little artifacting. If you get it in a game, it substantially affects the visual quality of the game, especially in something like a multiplayer game. So, all right. Any any last comments? Will you guys pick this up? Will you guys test this out? Do we know how much it is? Yeah, that's no. the big question. But I mean, it's you don't have to... like. It's either going to be subscription or you pay for the games, right? So, oh, uh, right. There's no. I, I don't know what other market. It's not. There's no physical device. It's not like you have to I, pay for I, anything. I assumed you had to buy the controller, which God knows how much that's going to be because it has like voice assistant functionality built into it. I don't then... think you'll need to buy the controller. I think the controller is optional. Right, because because in terms of, that's like if you wanted to use Netflix, you had to buy a Netflix remote or something like that. That'd be kind of weird. I think Google's aim on this is to make it accessible for everyone. Mm-hmm. And if you had to buy a physical thing. Accessible they wa- for everyone. 35 megabits. Because they want to advertise this thing on YouTube, right? And uh-huh. then you just click that button, play now, and then you're in the game. Not play now, oh, fill out the shipping form so we can ship you a controller in two weeks and then you can play the game. That's what I think. Wait, wait, yeah, because cause you can play this game with mouse and keyboard, so why would you need to have the controller? Oh, okay, then then it feels a lot better than what I first thought. I was like, you can use your own controller. I thought you had to, like, have this controller around somewhere. And Yeah, the and demo the guy was controller. playing with, the demo the guy was playing Doom with mouse and keyboard. And then on this article it says the service will also support wired USB controllers and mouse and keyboard controllers. I controls. see. Yeah. All right, let's move on from that. Uh, we're going to talk about some, some video games at last. All right. Let's talk about, let's talk about Master Chief. Oh, okay. Mm-hmm. He's coming, guys. He's, he's oh, finally okay. here to finish he's the coming. fight on he's PC. Here to, the, how, I don't know how many years later. How long have these rumors been going on for of, like, Master Chief Collection coming to PC? I feel like it's been four years or, like, three or four years. As long as the game has been out on Xbox One. Yes, I agree. But, you know, guys, it's finally here. All right, I got some questions. Okay. Do you think this is a good idea, first of all? Yes. Yeah, of course. All right. Okay, next question. question. (laughs) question. Follow-up question. Xbox, you know, they're not they're not doing horrible, right? They're not they're not in the Wii U dumpster days, but they're oh. not, obviously they're in last place in this generation of consoles or the current generation because mm-hmm. I guess the Switch they're is in top three. Okay, one ahead. <laughs> okay, they're beating out the end gauge. Anyways, um, but what do you think of Microsoft sort of not really giving away because it's been a while since this game came out on Xbox, but sort of their play anywhere mantra of releasing games on Xbox and PC. Mm-hmm. I, I think in this day and age, it's it's something that any developer, regardless of who they are, need to consider is the PC platform. And I think, you know, Capcom's come out recently saying things about PC. Uh, and I think Microsoft is just following suit. They're recognizing that PC is a powerful platform with a very large user base. And I mean, there's really nothing to lose by putting their games on it. Uh, same with me. I think, you know, Microsoft is also working to put their, what, the live pass? Is that what it's called? Game pass? Game, Game pass. pass. Like, they're bringing it to the Switch, which, I, question mark? But Yeah, that like, one was weird. <laughs> I think it's definitely a good move. I think, especially, like Alex said, for developers, this is dream come true. You don't have to build things for three separate consoles you don't have to build it for pc on top of that you basically do it for one platform and it just gets spread across all the user base so you know and and for people like me who don't who have never owned an xbox this is like a good chance for me to play these games finally Mm -hmm. so you can finally play gears pop so i can finally finish the fight against the horde in gears pop 
Exactly. What do you guys think of the monetization model? I forget if they officially released. I've seen like a couple different things where you're going you have to buy the games like separately. You can buy them all in a bundle or buy them separately. I guess I that's all right. Game Pass was like I thought it was like a sub thing. You had to sub to Game Pass to get this? Did they say that? Are we talking about Game Pass or are we talking about Master Chief? We're talking about collection? Master Chief Collection. Oh, I had a question about that. How the hell does this game work? I thought it was just a single game and it just came with a couple games inside, but it like from the article it sounds like they're releasing more games onto it. Um that might be how it will turn out. So I have this game on on my Xbox One and it's essentially on the front, right? It comes with Halo, Halo 2, Halo 3, Halo ODST. Uh-huh. And Halo Reach, I don't remember if it had it. Um, but it's like um you just choose what game you want to play and there's like the whole remastered campaign and everything. Yep. Um but obviously if it's the Master Chief Collection, if they remaster Halo 4, they could add it on technically, right? Yeah, they they said they're adding Halo 4, which I I got really confused about. Like are they just going to add a game? Yeah. To yeah. Pretty as much. DLC? Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Remastered to play yeah. on the world's most powerful console. I'm not really sure why they're going with the, like, staggered release schedule. Because they said they're going to start with Halo Reach and then release them in chronological order. But, oh well. I I guess that's a strategy. I'm not sure why. Are they going to start what. with Reach? Yeah, that's you what they... chronological going forward or back? Uh, I guess story chronological. So oh, Halo okay. Reach would be okay. first, and then it goes Combat Evolved, etc., okay. etc. Interesting. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, Reach Gosh, was really, a favorite. I'm really confused. I thought there was a new Halo game coming out, but I don't see it on... Halo Wiki. Infinite? Infinite, okay. Uh, that one got teased. No release date ever in sight, so we don't know when that's coming out. But yeah, mm-hmm. it's finally here, guys. We can finally play split screen co op and Kilimanjaro and things like that. Mm-hmm. And you can relive the glory days of uh, Combat Evolved multiplayer on PC. You can. With potentially more cheaters, but okay. Potentially, yeah. But you also get the OP pistol, so. You do. Oh. It balances out. Ooh. If you were to play one of them, which one would you play? I would probably play Halo 3. That one was my favorite. Out of all of them, I put the most time into Combat Evolved, so that would be definitely the one I'd play. I was Halo 2. Ever... Oh. Mm. I mean, my friends had it, so we would play at, yeah. at their house. Plenty of people loved Halo 2. That one actually came out for PC, though, right? It did, for Games for Windows Live, that fantastic <laughs> service. All right, let's 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 move on from Halo. We gotta we gotta keep the trainer rolling. We got... We got a little tease, guys. A little tease. We got some maybe Borderlands 3. I think we've brought this up before on this podcast, but I just want to touch on it again because now it's seeming like it's real. Yeah, it's getting more and more real. Um, Gearbox is essentially teasing that they're going to announce Borderlands 3, maybe Duke Nukem, but probably Borderlands 3 at PAX East um, later this That's March. This- that's next weekend. I don't have any questions, guys. I this is <laughs> You're just letting us know. Thanks. I'm just Alan. letting I'm just letting the people know. Okay. What do you think here? I had I had some things. I actually lied to you. I had some things. Um What is this game how how different is this game gonna be? Is it gonna be more the same? Or is it gonna be different? Art style? What do you think? They're gonna go cell shaded or are they gonna go more realistic? To be honest, I was just expecting more of the same. Like if you look at pre sequel they really didn't change anything. I mean, I'd, I'd be down for more of the same. Pre-sequel like, was interesting because saying... it was on the same engine, right? As yeah. two. I wouldn't. I wouldn't be mad if it was more of the same. I, I liked. Uh, I like Borderlands just the way it is. Yeah, I think what we'll see is just a graphical upgrade. Obviously, in terms of particle effects, things like that, it'll be shinier, prettier. But I think they'll go with the same kind of art style. Very similar gameplay, and I really can't fault them for that. It's a pretty unique shooter experience to have that kind of uh, skill build making and things like that you think it'll be like four classes probably or do you think maybe more this time from the get-go obviously they added some in dlcs but maybe they'll just be one class and you're like skyrim man you just choose whatever job you want 
Yeah, like maybe it's an MMO, Final mm-hmm. Fantasy fourteen with guns. <laughs> yeah, you what just play it's... any job you want. Guys, what if there's a Battle Royale mode? Uh, I thought about that immediately when the tease in happened. In 2019? I know. People are already dropping off that train, Albert. Hey, Battlefield's about to hop on that train <laughs> oh, next <God>. week. <laughs> They're right on time. <laughs> a train wreck. Mm-hmm. I actually think that it would work somewhat okay. Because mm-hmm. there's already, Borderlands like... Borderlands or BF? Borderlands. Yeah, I Because there's already, thinking. like, an inventory system, right? There's already things like shields, different gun types... Different, you pick up different ammo types. I think it would work. There's different classes. I honestly think it's it's pretty much like Apex Legends a little bit. Although you'd have like even more RNG because some of the guns would have like really bad rolls or something. On yeah, that'd stats. be cool. That'd be cool. Even oh, that'd more be cool. RNG for BR. Yeah, exactly. So, to be honest, mm-hmm. I I would I prefer the gunplay in Apex over Borderlands. If you know if they made a battle royale, royale I would probably play Apex still. Hmm. Yeah, if anything, I'd like to see improved in Borderlands. It would probably be the gunplay. It always felt a little soft. I don't know how to explain it otherwise. I would like them to improve the vehicle play, because the vehicle play oh, is pretty well, boring yeah. in every game. If they could make that a lot better, that would be cool. Like customizable vehicles or something like that. Random vehicles. This car has half a wheel. <laughs> this car has only wheels. <laughs> But then who knows? Because they were also showing off some uh, Duke Nukem and, you know, other properties like that. I think Bulletstormy was shown, so they could be playing anything, I think, Gearbox at this point. All right. We're moving on to our favorite series, which is not actually our favorite series, but it's Call of Duty. Remember Blackout Mode? Actually, what has happened to that? That, I think think Apex happened. (laughs) I think Apex happened. To, I think Fortnite and Apex just kind of ate it alive. I'm yeah, Fortnite it came out, out after. Mm-hmm. Oh, ooh. anyways, Modern Warfare Four. We're gonna talk about it being developed by Treyarch, right? Um, there, there's always this weird thing with Call of Duty games and how they're developed by three different studios, so they all kind of have their ebb and flows of how they design their games. Um. But, big shift for this one, rumored, no specialist mode, or no battle royale mode, so no blackout this time, instead opting to focus on a single player and traditional multiplayer experience. Right move? Wrong move? Completely right move. I mm-hmm. I don't know what's uh, fragmenting the battle royale base across two different games would do if one of them can't. Even I, I actually don't know how, how many people play Blackout anymore, but I don't think fragmenting that is a good idea because multiplayer definitely needs like a lot less people to sustain than BR. Mm-hmm. That's true. I feel like you can get a good grasp of which Battle Royale game is doing well based on how many people on Twitch are watching it. Uh, are you sure? You just mean you mean how much money they're paying the creators? Oh yeah, we won't talk the about streamers? that. streamers. But... Yeah. Didn't Are streamers not like creators? Million... Oh, they're content, content creators. They're content yeah. creators. Yeah. That's what you mean. I thought you were talking about actual creator of the game. Oh. Might be. Do you think that this decision to not focus on specifically Battle Royale is more of a Treyarch doesn't really want to go down that path as well as when this game comes out? You know, they don't... Battle Royales are kind of like a flavor of the month sort of thing. And while a traditional Call of Duty multiplayer that they focus a lot of time on might have a lot of staying power within their fan base, if they sort of focus on Battle Royale, if like when Apex Le- when the next Apex Legends comes out, the whole player base just kind of moves on, and they kind of want to avoid that. Mm-hmm. I I think they have the issue of, you know, now like the fragmentation issue I was talking about. Now they are splitting the player base even more across their own multiplayer mode and battle royale mode, right? Mm-hmm. And they may be neglecting the primary game mode of multiplayer that Call of Duty is kind of known for. I haven't seen many opinions of uh, Black Ops if it's kind of you know gone downhill or been a lot less uh, fun to the majority of the fan base compared to the previous titles. But I could see it possibly happening. 
uh, when they were using that time to develop Blackout more. And Treyarch may just kind of recognize that. Maybe they'll make a more refined modern warfare experience. It's been a little while since we've actually seen a modern warfare uh, era game of this style uh, made. And I think I've seen some people even ask for it. So, yeah, they might just be looking to put all their cards in one basket for just a classic Call of Duty experience. I like it. And I can't fault them for that, because I, I don't know, I've been contemplating going back to the Call of Duty, but the Black Ops series just doesn't appeal to me. I don't like the idea of specialists, special powers and all that. I, I'd rather just be a normal soldier guy. What about uh, World War II? Did you ever think about picking that one up? Uh, very briefly, but I read into the lack of, like, guns and stuff, and it just kind of turned me off from it. Ah. Uh, and overall, for all its faults, Battlefield Five is a pretty fun shooter, and it's mostly what I wanted from a World War II shooter. Alrighty. Uh, we got some extra Call of Duty news, because, because, you know. Mm-hmm. Call of Duty Mobile, coming out to your smartphone you all have phones, right? I mean, yeah, after right? Diablo Immortal, I had to pick one of those things up. Let me just say, guys, that this is the, actually, historically, the second Call of Duty game to release on a mobile device. Mm. The original being Call of Duty on your N-Gage. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, technically, there were a few titles for, like, Nintendo DS, too, right? But that's not on your phone. That's, that's exactly. Not phone. It's not a mobile device. It's not it's a, just mobile a, device. a mobile handheld gaming device. Exactly. I need to be able to call someone on this thing. All right. I could call mm-hmm. someone on my taco phone. I can't call someone on my th- on my DS. What is uh? I can't remember. Pick a chat. Not a not a valid chatting platform. Once you own some noobs, you you, you have to be able to call your mom and be like, "Mom, get the camera." Right. <laughs> wait, and uh-huh. then you're like, "Wait, my phone is a camera." Oh my oh. god. Then you are mom. Oh. Just, when are you going to oh. tweet, like, we're, what about the real OG Call of Duty mobile? And then <laughs> on the Engage. Link, link the Engage one. <laughs> or viewport tweet it. Uh, and then, and then link to our, uh, retrospective collective. No. Mm. Um, let's move into our last story of the day. We got Capcom is back, baby. Um, this is kind of following a trend from last year. We got the ramp up, right? We got the ramp up. We got Monster Hunter World. Ooh, ah, coming to PC. Ooh, ah, right? We're like, ooh, mm-hmm. Capcom making some slick moves. Then we we're like, and then, oh man, it's coming out like half a year later though. Okay, well, it's still coming. Ouch. In, it's but still it's coming. coming in general, yep. all right? We're waiting. Yeah, we're waiting. We patient gamers, all right? And then E3 comes. We're like, ooh, ah, Capcom, what, what are you doing, E3? Ooh, Raccoon City, oh, Resident Evil. Leon, Leon. are you okay? All right. And then, and then this year, right? We saw, you know, there was Devil May Cry 5. We knew it was coming. Mm-hmm. But we're like, but how's this game actually going to be? Ooh, ah, it's good. Ooh. All right. <laughs> Capcom, boys, it's on a roll, all right? Yeah, they, they definitely struck has- gold. Guys, let's evaluate the, the 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 words. Is Capcom back? Is it too soon? <laughs> Is it too soon? Too soon for them to come back? To them for them to say that they're back? You know, they had some dark years, right? Oh yeah, they did. Street Fighter Five release. That Marvel was... vs. Capcom Infinite. Uh, I mean, you guys don't even remember that game. I but... remember so... the Infinity Stones. Mm-hmm. So now you bring that up. I want to say right now. Capcom is back for all their non-fighting game games. Yeah, that, that's the main thing. I really feel to say they are truly fully back. They need to release a solid fighter title. Justin, do you agree with that? Sure. I mean, I don't... Why, why not? I, I don't really play their fighting games, so I, I could mm-hmm. I could care less. All but you play outs- is Tekken. Outside of the fighting games, I honestly think they're back. I think we've been talking about this since this podcast mm-hmm. started. Yeah, they've like done a major rebirth. Ever since Monster Hunter World, they just they can't stop making good games, and they're just really enjoyable to play. I... And now they want to yeah. the Devil May Cry. He wants to make Dragon's Dogma too, right? 
Yep, he's talking about it again. I'd love to see a Dragon's Dogma sequel. That game was so fun. If you haven't played it, go out, play it. Great, underrated title. I, I would say this this rebirth of Capcom almost started with Resident Evil 7. That, yeah. that kind of mm-hmm. got the ball rolling. Um, And I want to... I, I, the question I had was, can they continue the success? But I more want to rephrase it after Alex bought, brought it up and sort of say, is the last thing to fully, like, claim, reclaim their glory is to finally fix their fighting games? Which, honestly, Capcom was known for the most was their mm-hmm. fighting games, but... Yeah, don't get us wrong, Street Fighter V is now very popular, but it still has some dissenters out there, so... You know, maybe maybe try again at Marvel versus Capcom. I don't know if uh, Disney will let them with the Marvel license, but that would that would be hype. I'd like hey, to see I'd like to see a new uh, MVC game. If Disney is letting EA play with Star Wars all this time, I'm sure mm-hmm. they'll give it back. Yeah, Capcom, they're doing good, guys. You done good, son. I will say right now, shameless plug for me. I chose Capcom as my publisher of the year last year for the Viewport Awards. Ha. Ha. All right, everyone. That wraps it up for episode 24 of Viewport Relay. Viewport Relay is available as I, I can talk English. Viewport Relay is available on Radio Public, iTunes, Google Music, Stitcher, Podbean, and all your favorite podcast directories. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to subscribe, review, and share it with your friends. We're also on social media as Viewport Gaming on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. But Tristan Jung, why Viewport Gaming? Well, Viewport Relay is part of Viewport Gaming, a website that provides a look into video games through reviews, features, and podcasts. You can check out all Viewport Gaming content or Viewport content at viewportgaming.com. Thank you, Tristan. And as always, I've been your host, Albert Corson, joined by Tristan Jung. Goodbye. And Alex Nestor. See ya. We'll see you guys, and gals, and aliens, next time.